In this video, we'll discuss the very simple and important notion of a span. Now here's another example of a perfectly straightforward geometric concept that finds an algebraic analog. So what is a span? I will give you the definition first, and then we'll illustrate the definition with our favorite examples of vector spaces. So here it comes. Suppose you have two vectors, a and b, and spans work with any number of vectors. We could have more than two vectors, we could have just one vector, and spans even work with zero vectors. So let's use two vectors for our definition. So suppose we have two vectors a and b, and once again we're not specifying what kind of vectors a and b are, because spans work with all kinds of vectors, like any concept that can be captured by an algebraic expression, preferably in terms of linear combinations, it is a perfectly general concept that applies to all vector spaces. So given two vectors, a and b, consider the set of all possible linear combinations of a and b. So consider all vectors that can be represented as alpha a plus beta b, where alpha and beta are arbitrary real numbers, all possible combinations of real numbers. That subset of vectors is called the span of a and b. And it might be written as span, and then in parentheses a comma b. And if we had more than two vectors, we would just put more than two, all of these vectors in parentheses. So span is a very nice word in that we no longer have to say the set of all possible linear combinations, we can just say span. So linear combinations was a good term because we no longer had to say uh, sums and products with numbers, we could just say linear combinations. And now instead of saying all possible linear combinations, we can simply say span. Very nice word. So let me illustrate the span with a few examples before we talk its properties. And it really has only one property that's totally easy to see. So let's start with geometric vectors and you will see why we use the word span. So consider two geometric vectors in space and now we're going to consider all possible linear combinations of these two vectors. So what can we get by considering all possible linear combinations of these vectors? Well, we can actually get the entire plane in which these two vectors lie. So I think it's intuitively clear, but we haven't actually discussed precisely why we can get the entire plane. But we'll clarify that point soon enough when we talk about decomposition. So for now, let's just say it's intuitively clear that we can get all the plane, not just the space between the vectors, but the vectors outside this angle and even behind this angle if you consider negative values for alpha and beta. So now you see why the word span makes sense because you may refer to this space between the two vectors as the span. Just as you say that uh, a bridge spans the two banks of a river. So these two vectors perhaps span this space. So it kind of makes sense, except of course in linear algebra the word span refers not just to this space but to the entire plane, within the angle, outside the angle, and even on the opposite side. So that's the span of two of these two vectors. It's the plane in which they lie. Okay, for another example, what if we consider two vectors that lie along the same line? Well, now the span of these two vectors is the line uh, on which these two vectors lie. You cannot get anything outside of this line. So the span has just become smaller. So now you're really seeing that the span is the set of vectors that these two vectors generate by all possible linear combinations. It's sort of the space in which these two vectors live in the narrowest possible sense. Okay, so that's all you get. What about with three vectors? Well, with three vectors that don't all lie in the same plane, like this, you can get the entire space. So these three vectors span the entire space. Once again, this point needs to be clarified, but we'll clarify it when we talk about decompositions. And if these three vectors are actually in the same plane, well, then they don't span the entire space. They only span the plane they're in. So as you might have guessed, and before we talk about polynomials and vectors in Rn, 
you might have guessed that the span of any number of vectors is actually a subspace. It's not just some subset, it's a subspace in the sense that if you take two vectors from the span of A and B and add them together, you get another vector from the span of A and B. And if you take a vector from the span of A and B and multiply it by any number, you'll get another vector from the span of A and B. So it's not just a subset, it's actually a subspace. It's a mini vector space of its own. It's a vector world in and of itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's actually prove that. The word proof is not something I'm fond of, but sometimes proofs are very helpful, especially when they're very insightful and you can learn something from that. I don't like proofs when you have to technically show something that you can see is true anyway, and it becomes a formal exercise. But here it's actually a fun exercise where we'll say, oh, I see, that's very nice. And it's a very short proof. So let's take two vectors from the span of A and B, and you will see it's a perfectly general proof. It's a proof in which we're not talking about geometric vectors or polynomials or any other specific kind of vectors. We're just doing it in complete generality. Something that's very nice about linear algebra, takes a little bit of time to get used to, but it's wonderful to develop your brain in this way. So let's consider, so we're going to consider two vectors from the span of A and B. And so each one of them is a linear combination of A and B. So let's say that the first vector has coefficients alpha one and beta one, and the second vector has coefficients alpha two and beta two. So any vector from the span is by very definition a linear combination of A and B. So here I took one vector from the span and here I took another vector from the span so it may have different coefficients. Now what if I were to add them together? Would I get another linear combination of A and B? Or could it be something that just cannot be expressed as a linear combination of A and B? Well let's add them together. So we'll add them together and we'll use you can either call it our intuition or the distributive law, but you will have alpha 1a plus alpha 2a, which of course is alpha 1 plus alpha 2a plus, and the same thing will happen here, you can factor b out, and you get beta 1 plus beta 2b. And lo and behold, we have another vector that can be represented as a linear combination of A and B. The coefficients of this vector are alpha 1 plus alpha 2, that's the first coefficient, and beta 1 plus beta 2, but it's very important that what we have is this coefficient times A plus this coefficient times B. So once again, a linear combination of A and B. So we once again have a vector that's in the span of A and B. And, I'll leave, and the second part of the proof I'll leave as a simple exercise for you. If you have a vector like this and you multiply it by an arbitrary number, do you get a new vector that's a linear combination of A and B? The answer will be absolutely yes, but I'll let you prove it. So the span is not only a subset of the entire space, but it is actually a legitimate subspace. It is a subset that is a space in its own right meaning that uh, whatever vectors you pick from that set, any linear combination of those vectors is once again in that set. So we no longer have to say, if you pick two vectors, their sum is in that set, and a product with a number is in that set. We can take advantage of the term linear combinations. So we now define vector spaces as any kinds of objects whose linear combinations are another object of the same kind or in this case, in the same subset. Okay, let's move on to polynomials, now that I think we understand spans pretty well. So consider these two polynomials, and consider all possible linear combinations of these polynomials. Now there is something about these two polynomials that's peculiar, not particularly peculiar, but there is a special property. You may already know what it is because we've discussed it before, but we'll discuss it in greater length in one of the following videos. But at this point, just about all I can say about the span of these polynomials is that it's some subspace 
of the space of quadratic polynomials. And remember, when we say quadratic polynomials, we mean polynomials of degree up to 2. Right? But that's about all we can say. We can say that any linear combination, well, that's what's in the span of these two polynomials. So it's some subspace. Uh, an interesting question would be, well, is it a proper subspace, meaning not the entire space? Or could this possibly be the entire space of quadratic polynomials? There are other very interesting questions that I can ask, but I'll save them until the next video. But you have to realize that if I all I mean at this point, all I'd like to say at this point is if we take two polynomials from the span of these two polynomials and add them together or multiply them by numbers, we'll get another polynomial from the same span. That's just something that we proved convincingly over here. And it applies to uh, these polynomials. And it's actually the key to answering whether or not these two polynomials span the entire space. Okay, now let's move on to R3. We could consider the span of these two polynomials, excuse me, of these two elements in R3. And it would be a subspace of R3. And that's really all we can say at this point. We could ask the same question, and in this case we can answer it rather easily, and we'll do it in this video. Save polynomials for the next one, but R3 will answer it in this video. Is the span of these two vectors all of R3, or is it a proper subspace of R3, meaning that not all of R3? And the answer here is very clearly not all of R3. Can you see why? Because all of the vectors in the span of these two vectors will necessarily have zero for the second entry. They will necessarily have zero for the second entry. It's one of those properties that you cannot break by linear combinations. And so any linear combination of these two vectors will have this property. So synonymously, all of the vectors in the span of these two vectors will have the property that the middle entry equals zero. So no, you cannot get the entire R3. And then of course, there's an addition, a, a straightforward follow-up question, which is, well, you cannot get all of R3, but can we at least get all of the vectors such that the middle entry is zero? Right? We know that all we can get is that, but can we actually get all of the vectors whose middle entry is zero? Well, this and other questions will be answered rather easily later on in the course. Some of these questions will be answered very soon, possibly in the very next video.